What I'm going to do now is try to make a case for why data is so important in society and actually why the world would be better if we were actually to tap into more data and use it for all the great ways it can be used, even though we need to be extraordinarily cautious about how we interact with it because it actually could do some very dangerous things for us. And let me begin by talking about bloodletting. Now, we know that if, that if something happens to us, particularly in the era of COVID, if we go into a healthcare setting, we can actually be saved. And medical science is indeed a science, and they are going to protect us by using the best that they can about empirical evidence to understand how to treat patients. But you have to ask yourself, how was it possible that bloodletting was the standard treatment of care for almost all ailments for over 2,000 years? There's evidence of bloodletting in ancient Egypt and in ancient Greece. But bloodletting lasted not just through the Middle Ages, but deep into, well, relatively deep into the 1800s as well. At the time in which the Romantics and the Gothics were writing incredible literature that we still read today, like Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, which sort of seems to sort of pass the baton to us, or John Stuart Mill, the standard of care was to open up people's veins or arteries and remove their blood. That's weird. Why would that be the case? Well, they didn't use data. They didn't actually examine it and understand a lens through interacting with the world numer numerically and just to study to see if it was effective or not. Now, of course, statisticians love bloodletting because if you actually go into the advanced statistics classes, you'll see that it's not that bloodletting empirically doesn't work. There's a lot of empirical evidence that bloodletting works. It's just not good evidence. The reason is that the people who had their vein opened and died aren't there to say it didn't work, and everyone who had their vein opened and survived, who probably would have survived anyway, of course, because it didn't actually benefit the treatment, you know, attested to the great benefit of bloodletting. And so that's one reason why it went on. But it took a Frenchman in the 1800s to actually run the numbers, and with the data, could say and demonstrate bloodletting didn't work, in fact, was killing patients. And eventually, that idea and what they call you know, the numerical method, needed a term like that, got rid of bloodletting. So now we can look at ourselves in 2021 and realize that we're a society that is wise and doesn't make such mistakes. Bullshit, right? If you look at the world today, it's just the opposite. Where else are we doing the equivalent of bloodletting? thinking that we're doing the right thing when in fact we've not really examined it through the lens of data, and in fact we may well be doing the wrong thing. Email marketing campaigns now are all you know, living in the world of data. We see the open rates, we see the click-through rates, we test headlines. Public policy, policy interventions, should we give a stimulus or not? Education, what works, what doesn't? We are living in a world everywhere we look in which it is unexamined through the lens of information. And why this is such a tragedy is because we could actually make better decisions as a society if we actually embraced data and used it as the basis of our decision making. And the good news is that there's new techniques that enable us to do things with data that we never could before that was unfathomable. So let me try to think about this world not just of data, but of when we have big data, and we have more data, what we can do with it. Let me go quickly through this. So um, this is a cat. We all recognize it as a cat. And I know many of the cynical people here are thinking, yes, I've added a picture of a cat to make everyone feel nice and to wake you up and to say, oh, wow, it's great, it's a cat and it's nice. And you would be right. I put this in here only for the purpose of sort of making you all happy with it. But there's also another reason why, and that is if we were to define for an image recognition, recognition system what a cat looks like, we would basically describe the cat through the different features of it. So it has these cute little whiskers that come out, those almond-shaped eyes, right? that cute little nose, and that would be a cat. But of course, that's a cat face on. I mean, you need a cat from different perspectives to understand what a cat would look like, so we'd have to actually 
make our image recognition system and define all the rules very intricately for all the ways in which a cat might exist. And if we actually describe those rules perfectly, a computer will look at an image of a cat and therefore be able to define a cat. Problem, it's impossible to do, it's hard to do, right? But there's a better way than trying to explicitly define what a cat is, so a computer could identify a cat in an image recognition system. Instead, what we can do is give it lots of data. And if we give the algorithm, if we give the computer system lots and lots and lots of different examples of cats, some of which are noisy and not very good at all, it can infer through this abundance of millions of examples of cats, of all different kinds of cats, of all different angles of viewing the cat, what a cat looks like in an image, and then it can identify automatically if the image it's looking at is a cat or not. You can only do that if you have a lot of data so that the system can make the inference cat or no cat. Let me give a second example, which is sort of the exact same example, but in a different context, and that is through translation. If you have used Google Translate recently, it has become absolutely extraordinary. It is, I speak French and English, well, I speak English and my family do not believe I speak French, but I do. Um, and uh, it is absolutely extraordinary how good uh, the language pairs are, and you can do this for you know, 30, 40 different language pairs now. And in the past, and this is actually the true computer code, but this was hundreds of doc pages of documents, what was being done in the 1950s was overtly hand-coded trying to get the word pair, in this case of English and Russian, to identify which word during the height of the Cold War, what wor one word in one context meant in another word in, in another context, and it's hard to do. Because of course, you don't, need, you don't want to just know what is the word, because the word doesn't help you, because lots of words have lots of different shades of meaning, right? And the, for example, in English, we say light, and it could mean illumination, but it could also mean not heavy, right? And niger would work in one context, but not in another. So illumination would be the other. And so uh, the other technique that you would do is you would just get lots and lots of examples of translations from one language and the other. And if you have millions and millions of all the books that have been translated, all the EU documents that have been translated, all the corporate websites that have been translated, and you have a corpus of a billion words in French and English, you now can make the world's best translator. Right? So the point is that you had to shift in your mindset from trying to explicitly teach the computer the rules to actually let the computer make an inference of what the right answer would be as a huge probability table. And what it takes is data and a lot of data. So that, if you will, is the big data story. And when we talk about big data, what we're really talking about is machine learning. Now, it doesn't always have to be machine learning, and there's also new techniques in which we can tap new data sources and do new forms of analytics with it. But the machine learning or artificial intelligence story today that we're seeing in the press is largely because these techniques that are, have been around for half a century are working really, really well for two reasons. The first is that we have faster processors and they're cheaper than ever. And the second, and maybe more importantly, we have more data. Okay, with more data, we improve the probabilities of our, of, of our inferences and therefore we have better translation systems. So what else can we do if we're living in a world of these inferences that we can make with more data? The first thing we can do is we can spot signals that we otherwise would miss. So Google, uh, rather Microsoft, although this is a Google search engine, the Microsoft's Bing engine several years ago wanted to identify whether they could predict whether two drugs taken together would create an adverse drug interaction, thereby, you know, creating a negative problem for someone's health by taking these two drugs rather than just being okay by taking them at the same time. And it turns out through search engine queries, and search engine queries alone, you could do that. Because when people are suffering certain forms of symptoms, it leaves sort of a trace, and these symptoms are almost like a fingerprint for the disease they're having. So if they've searched for one medication and another medication, and a list of symptoms, which basically would otherwise be background noise unless you identify what those drugs would be, you can now identify earlier than ever, in fact, identify in a way that you'd never otherwise know unless someone presented to a healthcare clinic that the person is having an adverse drug interaction. 
Now, the next uh, way in which you were able to, you're able to do this, let me actually take a step back and say, with this information, you would think that, uh, that, that search engines would now be surveilling their user population for people who are identifying these forms of, uh, of search queries to know they're actually having this problem. But they're not doing that. They're not allowed to because of privacy rules. This was only research, and you can do it under a research exemption, but you can't do it in practice. So maybe we need to change that. So the next one is this idea of new proxies. To continue watching this video, click the link in the top left or in the description below. Or visit iai.tv for more debates and talks from the world's leading thinkers on today's biggest ideas.